Hey, it's Brandon. Welcome back to Transform Your Workplace. This episode is brought to you by Zenium HR. Zenium is supporting small and medium-sized organizations for their employer services like human resources, payroll processing, benefits, training and development, compensation analysis, and so much more. Learn more about Zenium at zeniumhr.com. All right, today's episode is with a returning guest, Victoria Dew. She's the founder of Dew Point Communications. And in this episode, we're discussing her insights reports called The New Rules of Employee Engagement in Communication in the Late 2020 and Beyond. And this really applies to the beyond part of this. Victoria is one of the best at communication and engagement within organizations. She's got 15 years of internal communications experience across various industries. So you're going to learn a lot from her in this episode. And you're going to get a lot of information straight from the mouths of leaders who had a chance to talk to Victoria. And so this report is all a collection of data and where communication is going. And I'm sure a lot of organizations are struggling right now just because of the health crisis and making sure that the people are engaged and that the communication is continually flowing. So you're going to get a lot out of this episode. If you liked what you heard, go to Apple Podcasts and give us a five-star rating. I would really appreciate that. And if you would like, feel free to give a written review. That is always helpful. And I love reading every single one of those. So thank you for tuning in and make sure to subscribe so you get all of the new episodes every Tuesday. Thank you and talk to you next week. Victoria, welcome back. It's good to have you. Brandon, thank you so much for having me. I am so excited. I feel like it's it's been a minute since I was on the show last. And so I'm so excited to be back here with you. I'm trying to remember when you came on the first time. I definitely called the show HR for Small Business Podcast. And I'm pretty sure I was recording on Skype at the time. And I've moved on to several different tools since then. So it's been probably a couple of years. Right. Yes. I think I remember where I was sitting when we recorded the interview. Um, but what is time anymore, right? <laughs> well, especially this year where I feel like I've slept walked through the entire year. And I think a lot of people feel that way, right? It's just like a blur of the year. We're already in December and that seems insane. I mean, I remember the last couple people I saw in person in my office before the pandemic started in March. I went to two conferences, one in February, and one in the very beginning of March. And I think about that as now, like being out there in the world, like wandering around in rooms with people. And I'm like, what was I thinking, right? <laughs> so true. Well, the reason you're on the show today is you released a report recently called The New Rules of Employee Experience and Communication in, in Late 2020 and Beyond. So give us some background. Why did you do this report? Who did you in- interview for the report? Because it sounds like you did a lot of interviews. Um, when did it all take place? Was it during the pandemic? And you know what were you trying to discover as a result of that? Yeah. So the report came about. So I'll tell you just quickly about um, me and my background. Um, my company, Dew Point Communications, our focus is on helping um, people powered businesses to deliver, to communicate better with their employees every day so that they can deliver great employee experience at, that really drives business outcomes. And we've been, I've been doing this work for 15 something years and we work with a whole range of kinds of companies. I've probably worked in a dozen industries and sectors and everything ranging from startups to Fortune 500 companies um, in the US and overseas. So you know, I think like many people, the pandemic, there was the first phase of the pandemic and it was like kind of like being feeling in a blender, right? And I know, um, I think you know this about me, I normally travel about 60% of the time and I split my time uh, between Boston and Los Angeles. So when I first got back to Boston in March, I plunked my laptop down on my coffee table and just got to work. And I was so busy that it really wasn't until August that I kind of realized that I wasn't going anywhere and that I should probably 
actually turn a spare room into a home office. But I think what happened there, that was when the the need for the report really um, struck me in that I realized there was something that happened late summer in the zeitgeist, especially around remote learning. We're not going anywhere. And I think we heard so much about companies that did a great job communicating with their people, taking care of their people and responding in those first phases of the pandemic. But I wanted to know, okay, now this first like craziness is through and we're staring down another 12 months. Now, hopefully it won't be that long now, but we're really looking at a cent another year. Well, what does that look like? for companies, for employee experience, for communication, and knowing that people are burnt out and struggling and parents are struggling and non-parents are struggling and um, knowing what people have already been through, how are companies actually um, approaching this? And at first when I thought about it, I thought, um, oh gosh, well, everyone's already figured this out. (laughs) So I wanted to talk to, because of course my work, I work with so many different kinds of companies. Um, I wanted to make sure I got a range of business leaders. So senior people, people, senior HR, CHROs, people in talent, senior heads of uh, internal communications, and some um, non-people, people, business leaders as well. But I really wanted a range of companies, geographies, industries, sectors to look at trends really across the whole business landscape. So everything from startups uh, to the largest company and about 35,000 employees, including contractors, but all in all, about 70,000 employees' lives are impacted by the people I spoke with. That's incredible. When you first started you know, coming up with the idea for the report and, and even maybe crafting some questions you're going to ask the, the people that you're interviewing. I mean, did you have a hypothesis going into this? Did you lead them in a certain direction? What kind of questions did you ask? I mean, or did you just let them kind of free flow and just say what was on their mind and what they're thinking about right now? One of the things I was aware of was everyone really wanted to talk about how what they did during the pandemic, during the first phase, right? Yeah. And it was part of my role was to kind of steer them towards, okay, but what next? Which was easier in some cases than others. Some people I spoke with had a very clear strategy for where they were going. And some people, I mean, I think we're all building the plane while we fly it, but some people were building more of the plane. You know, I think when I first started this research, I thought, as I said, like, oh, everyone's already figured this out. The ship's already sailed. As I got into it, I realized not only is the ship not sailed, there's no ship. There's a bunch of like pieces of wood and some nails in many cases, you know? Yeah, no, I think you're right about that. And a huge spectrum and continuum. So the questions I asked were around what what they were doing, what they were planning on doing, what was concerning or keeping them up at night, what they were proud of or approaches they were taking that they were really proud of. But I always also wanted to, and you know this, and we've talked about it before, making sure that anytime we're talking about anything in the people space, um, employee experience, HR, communications, we always need to be so rigorous about connecting it back to the bottom line. Why is the people stuff important for business? And that was really a key focus of the questions as well. Yeah. What um, what were the key themes, just at a high level, what did you find from the report that just absolutely stuck out to you that you would consider kind of the biggest ahas? There are a few things. I think when I looked at kinds of companies and how they were doing and where they were kind of placed, one of the things I noticed was that there's a really nice sweet spot in mature startups. So um, companies that have been around for a while, they maybe, you know, you might not even necessarily think of them as startups, but they take the people stuff very important. Um, many of them, obviously, in SaaS or tech companies, they have to compete very hard um, for talent. And so they really understand the value of their employees and are very deliberate and intentional about creating not only a great employee experience, and of course that um, ties into communication. The other thing I noticed was um, really interesting, and we talk obviously a lot about values, certainly, but what I noticed was that companies who, um, first of all, had employees and had done a really great job of connecting their employees to values, to the company's purpose, which is so critical now, those companies they were hit harder or the, the initial phase of the pandemic, the remote work being away from their coworkers and their leaders was initially harder for them. And then what happened was as they went through the pandemic, what you would hope happened, which is that 
those values were there to support them. They had infrastructure, right? right? Both to draw on from a resilience perspective, from a communications perspective, from designing programs and initiatives and how leaders connected with people. That was all there to support them. Mm -hmm. You wrote in the report that the rules of employee engagement and communication have fundamentally changed. Why do you say that? Is it just because of the pandemic? Is it because of this is where we're going? This is the it's the evolving nature of business and the way we communicate? What is it? Great question. I think in so many ways, the pandemic catapulted us forward. It vaulted us into a new space. We were always going there. Um, one thing I would love to do more, um, look at it in the subsequent research is, you know, Gen Z, right? We know that they expect so much more of companies. So all of the things that we're building, especially around values, leadership, transparency, walking the talk, um, all of those things came front and, you know, there's just nowhere to hide anymore. So companies that didn't understand how important this was before suddenly were forced to contend with it. All those trends were already in progress. We just in this space in some weird sick way got a lucky break and got to fast forward through some of that. So that was really mission critical to get this stuff right. You wrote that a lot of um, the employee experience in general has just changed. And I'm curious what's changed about it. But first, maybe define... You do a really good job in the report about defining what is included in employee experience, what areas it covers. So maybe define that first for the listeners and how you think about employee experience. And then what's changed about it fundamentally? Employee experience, it's hard and easy to define. And I'm so aware now that I'm speaking to a community of HR and people ops folks. There are a lot of ways to define it. I guess one kind of thing I notice is how often people collapse. And I think your listeners will agree with me. Um, collapse employee experience and employee engagement. Right. Yeah. Employee experience you can define. And I use the Gallup definition because I just kind of like it and it fits in a lot of ways. That it is everything, you know, sort of like the employee life cycle or employer brand. It is everything that your employees see, touch, feel, experience, know about um, your company from before they come to work with you until after they leave. Um, so really that whole, I guess I think of it as an ecosystem, which is why I love, and this is one of the things I saw was companies that had, where they had a really strong relationship between employee experience and internal communications. They were so well placed to not only develop programs and initiatives, but to really bring people along on this change journey. So one of the frameworks I use for employee experience, which is the Gallup model, which is these real five kind of tiers, starting with workspace, actually, which is so weird because we never thought we used to think hmm. workspaces were ping pong tables, right? Or kombucha. And now it's like, do you have a, do you have sufficient lumbar support? You know, um, uh, do, are you working at your kitchen table? Uh, workspace and then team, that sense of belonging. And I really map them against those, um, you know, adaptation of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, so team, do I belong? Um, role clarity, do I understand what I'm actually supposed to be doing every day, which is obviously even more critical in a remote, you know, environment. Um, that manager relationship. I mean, this is another thing. We knew it before it comes through loud and clear. Managers are the linchpin. And I heard again and again, next year is the year of the manager. We are focusing on getting that piece right because that's the thing that's going to get us through this. I so agree. I'm glad you actually brought that up in the report because I fully agree with you on that with managers being a really key component to making sure that mission, vision, values, communication, all those things are are handled appropriately to make a good employee experience. There's another thing too, and especially in a remote, and I think we acknowledge even though, or I heard, I was speaking to someone the other day who said, um, we we're talking about the workplace and they said, the workplace isn't a place anymore. It's a state. There's no there, there, right? There's no, when we talk about workplace, we're actually not talking about real estate anymore, which is super exciting and interesting, right? Um, oh, it's so weird though to think about that. But it's, it's more, it's just bigger than that. It's not a desk and it's not, you know, it's more than that. Anyway. Um, no, I love it. The manager piece. So when you think about it, people, one of the things that came through, and this was one of the challenges or kind of um, warning bells you know, that I noticed was people, you've heard this too, you know, companies have been great about surveying a lot during this time. 
but they would get um, here, you know, sort of 40, 50, you know, 60% response rates. But there's a whole like lost employee category of people that are just out there roaming around the wilderness, right? Well, what happens? And are they struggling? Are we not hearing from them because they're having food insecurity, housing insecurity, you know? Um, Managers, again, are that listening post. They're the ones who can connect and bring those people along and also communicate to senior leadership where there are challenges that we need to address systemically. So not only is it the team and creating all the bonding, but they're, they're that level that can actually create consistency and impl- in that way, consistency and safety, I was going to say, which is also so critical to on a basic hygiene, you know, fundamental level. They're the only ones that can really do that. Yeah. It, when you said that the workplace is no longer a thing, you know, it's it's way bigger than that. And then you, you, when you were talking about just employees at home uh, working remotely in different spots, their uh, home environments are different, their needs are different, they may have a tough situation. That just got me to think like, wow, it's not all created equal. And so now managers do have to be that point where they're they're listening and learning and figuring out what their employees need. And I think it's it's much more uh, so like this than ever, right? Like where they, they really have to listen to their people and connect with them and communicate effectively to make sure that they're having a good experience. One of the things that I, I was just saying this the other day that when, you know, one of the things we know that just good practice is for managers when you have a one-on-one with your employee, especially remotely, to start now asking them how they are and making that personal connection and not just launching into the to-do list which is more natural for some managers than for others. And one of the pieces of advice I gave in this context was, look, if asking someone about their cat or their kids or their home feels uncomfortable, go back to the bottom of that Maslow's hierarchy of needs and those that employee experience with workstation, right? And talk to them for a few minutes about their office chair or their Wi-Fi connection. Like, Mm. do you have the tools you need to do your job? Is your kitchen table comfortable? Like, you can start with that because it's actually a way into their home and a way into their personal life. And from that, you can kind of work. But in some ways, it can be that basic, you know? Yeah, I love that. In talking about communication... Um, I know you've asked people that you interviewed for for this report about communication. Are they being more open with employees about the business, the organization? Are they more protective of information? I'm just curious, like if they're sharing more or they're sharing less than before the pandemic started. A real continuum spectrum of responses there, and it. You know, I think there's this shift in senior leaders and CEOs. You know, there were the ones who always understood the importance of radical transparency of being present with their people. Let's say it's 50%. And let's say the other 50%, there's 25% that didn't really get it before. But quickly during the first phase of the pandemic, we're like, oh, gosh, we need to really be consistent. We need a cadence. Yes. The cadence is key. Cadence is the word. I think cadence is like maybe the other word of 2021. And then there's, let's say, the last 25%, and it might be a different number, who are like, nope, and we're going to batten down the hatches, and we're going to right protect our ranks. And I've certainly worked in organizations like that, and I don't work there anymore. And um, I think, God help you for if you're that kind of leader, because history is not on your side. So what I saw was some organizations that did it very naturally. They had leaders who got that around being transparent um, and here's what we know. Some that had to learn it in real time and made big progress. But one of the like easiest, again, some of these things are so fundamental. Easiest things was saying on October 1st, we're going to give you another update on what we're doing in terms of workplace and what this is going for. And it may be that nothing has changed or that we don't know. But you can expect that on October 1st, you'll hear from us. You can expect that you'll hear from us on the 15th of each month. You can expect there will be a town hall on this date. So reducing uncertainty anywhere you can, right? Even if you don't have anything to say. That's so, that's so true. Yeah, it's just about the connection and feeling like you're a part of something too. Like we were talking about the Maslow's hierarchy of needs and the belonging piece. I mean, some of just communicating, even if you have nothing to say, is just a way in which employees can feel connected. Even if you're not saying anything that's like earth shattering. It is that really. And I think this is also this thing of, you know, your people, your employees are humans and they're struggling. Everyone is struggling and we're going to continue to struggle. 
right? But one of the things is also back to managers. Managers are people too. And as much as we're relying on them, what I also saw was some really cool innovative approaches to supporting managers and creating um, programs and like frameworks for how those managers can also have a cohort and community and feel like they're not alone on an island, supposed to be leading their teams when really they're having a lot of uncertainty, insecurity, panic, chaos as well. Something that we did at Zenium. I think the timing was just kind of coincidental, but we did it right as the pandemic started. We called, we basically have like a large middle management group and then we have like an executive leadership team. And this this group of managers is like 15, 20 people. And so when we're in a meeting together, it's just there's so many people and there's not everybody can talk. So we broke into what we call action learning groups and there's like four or five managers per group. And this again happened right as a pandemic started and we started breaking into these groups and we meet consistently once a month and we talk about the issues and they're cross-functional too. So like I'm with a group that is sprinkled across the company, not in my same function. And it's just amazing to hear like what's happening with their people. You know, how can we grow as leaders and just like digging into issues and talking about them like it's so powerful. And if you're talking about managers are the future and they need to grow and develop, you know, in 2021 and beyond, I encourage people to start there. It's a cheap way to do it. It's an hour uh, a month per leader. And it's I mean, it's a really good way to build trust and, um, you know, teamwork across the organization. So just I thought I'd add that because it related to what you were talking about. I agree. There's so many opportunities for managers and so many different ways to be creative. It's absolutely something that um, we do a lot of work on, which is creating that way. You also mentioned about that cross-functional, you know, how do we replace serendipity and mm. knowledge sharing? <laughs> right. A professional development opportunity in terms of, you know, it might be a program or, you know, coaching program for managers. And that might be professional development, but also think about the professional development of just having that group of cross-functional managers learning more about different parts of the business, being able to build context and make connections, you know, in some ways that got easier this year in a weird way. What about returning to work? Are, Are the people that you interviewed, are they even talking about it? Are they making plans for it? Um, or is it a, is it a pipe dream at this point? Is it, maybe they're not even focused on that. Maybe they're just saying, you know what, we're going to just get used to this remote work stuff and figure out how to make it work the most effectively can. So I think it's a few things there. I think one, you know, now touch wood and certainly this, you know, the report, I mean, I knew that as soon as I finished this report, parts of it would be outdated immediately and parts of it would <laughs> were, I had great confidence that parts of it were, would be enduring. And I'm pleased to say that that's true. Um, you know, we have good news about uh, vaccines and, you know, some kind of idea that a return to work place, a physical space by July, let's say in the United States is not a crazy idea. Whereas even a few months ago, that might have seemed like kind of a crazy idea. I haven't seen people talking about, okay, what that actually looks like, because what a, what is cool is it's really in this imagining stage of, we get to press reset. We're out of these leases in many cases, and it's a super fun time for me because it's like, what do we want it to look like? How do we want to work? And what is actually going to bring out the best in our people and get the best results? Actually, there's some interesting research and I can share with you older research that basically confirms, I think, what we know, which is that about 20% of people want to work from home always. About 20% of people want to work from home never. And everyone in the middle wants a hybrid, right? So I think we kind of know that's where for desk-based, traditionally desk-based workers, not front, necessarily frontline or um, or in warehouse roles, um, I think we know that we're headed for a hybrid model. And I think there, you know, especially when you think about, okay, what are we going to do with this space we have? Well, then it's like training as team building. But when we come together in whatever way that looks like, the real fun and I think opportunity is when we get together in our physical forms in one place, what are we doing? Like what is powerful? What really catapults us forward there? Um, and that's good. We get to be creative and really, again, intentional about that. Yeah. What are employers saying about work-life balance since everything sort of is blended together right now? <laughs> And this is, I think, one of the areas where we did get to make a great leap forward this year. Um, You know, I say we we used to talk about bringing your whole self to work. 
but then like your whole work just moved into your house and like won't leave. Right. You know? yeah. So work life balance. And you know, everyone's kind of trying to figure it out. One of the alarm bells that I saw was that I'm watching for is, you know, I think there was a lot of flexibility, latitude, understanding about, especially with parents. And, you know, during this first part of, you know, this year, we know that companies, as we move into economic recovery, we know that companies are going to need to make up for their losses. And we know they're going to need to shift back into hyper growth. And we know that that comes with often putting more pressure on our people, which is kind of where we started from. So in terms of work-life balance, we also know that um, people are struggling. We know there's genuine risks to mental health, to breakdown, to burnout, to attrition. Um, we know that, you know, we know what what's going on with women in the workforce now who have, in many cases, I don't even want to say opted out or but have forced to opt out, have taken a serious back step in a way that sets uh, yep. women in the workplace back many years. Um, so we know all that's going on and there are actual really serious business risks. So it is a big question. I don't think we'll talk about work-life balance anymore. When I think about the future of work, it's really about the future of life. And the future of work and how we work and how we work together is part of this new world we're creating. Yeah. And, you know, something that I think about a lot, too, with just the whole question of work-life balance, now that people are home, is just making sure that we're regularly asking our people what they need and how they're doing. And, you know, something that you wrote in the report and, you know, we've seen pop up in our organization and with our clients too, is this idea of pulse surveys and use of one-on-ones and just documenting things that way and, and seeing if there's common themes or if people are, the needs are changing. Are you seeing that more or less than before, you know, pulse surveys and quite frankly, asking people what they need? It's a great question. Absolutely seeing more pulse surveys. And I'll say that actually there's, in some ways that's great. And in some ways there are some alarm bells that go off for me there. And I'll tell you what. Really? Absolutely. Love to know. So one thing. So when I would ask people about voice of the employee, how they were listening to their employees, very often the response I got was, yes, we're doing a lot of pulse surveys. That's it? And they're not doing anything with it? <laughs> they are, but, but the connection I want to make there is that, that pulse surveys are one way that we listen. And they're one way of getting that voice of the employee. And I think there's a, and it's not that people aren't doing anything, but when I say voice of the employee, that's the first thing, right? So, and it is obviously more nuanced than that. The other thing that is, um, I think, really important is in terms of asking people what they need, and that is important, but also, you know, as a marketer, and you know this, there's the difference between stated preference and revealed preference. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> if you ask me what I want to buy at the supermarket, I'm going to say kale. But if you look at what's flying off the shelves, it's Fritos, right? Like if everyone was actually doing that, so there's partly what people want, and then there's what they actually mean by that. But the other beer and wine are flying off the shelves. I think we know that right now. Like so, there's what we say and what we mean and what we do about how we actually act. And there's another whole piece too, and it goes back to women in the workplace, which is I would not blame any parent for being incredulous about this whole like no 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 we're totally fine with you putting on your out of office to take care of your kids because we have generations and decades of parents who were really made to feel like splitting their focus between their work and their family. Exactly. And now we just suddenly change the rules, right? So you can't blame them for being a little suspicious, right? The other thing around surveys is when we talk about survey fatigue, and this comes up a lot, survey fatigue, it's, it's you said we did. Don't ask me what I want or what I think if you're not going to do anything with it. Yeah, exactly. If you're going to ask me a lot of times, then let me see the results of that. And that comes back to that really core part of internal communications. Um, and we, I call it, you said we did. And creating this virtuous circle of we listened to you and this is something that happened. Or we didn't or didn't happen. But it's because we heard you and this is the outcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting what you say about that. Because like we do, as any, we have a survey every year that we call what people want from work. And we just... We did it in July this year. This is the fifth year we've done it. And when we send out the reports and some of the clients are, they ask like, okay, now we got the data. Like, what do you usually tell people to do with it? And I'm like, 
Well, because some people are like, do we just share everything? Or because there's like comments and stuff like that. And I'm like, well, you got to share something because they took the survey and you, they know that you collected data. You got to you know, what are the themes? And then like at a high level, what, what's the, what'd you guys say? And then here's what we're going to start working on. So it's the action items. And without doing that, it's a huge miss. And I think you lose a little bit of trust there too. It's like, oh, okay, cool. We just did the survey. You collected a bunch of feedback. You're not going to do anything about it. You're not going to tell us what you're going to do with it. Like there needs to be a plan in place, especially when you're doing pulse surveys, annual surveys or anything like that. I think it's fair to the employees by doing it. I totally agree. And also the other thing that gets missed is the opportunity to co-create solutions. Yes, I love that. Beyond reporting back, this is what happened. Okay, this is what we heard. Let's begin. What do we want to do, right? Um, How should we approach this? What do you guys think about where we should go next? And that co-creation is important on so many levels. Partly it's empowering. It keeps people engaged in the process because they've had a hand in it. But it also drives ownership and accountability, right? It's very easy to Monday morning quarterback and complain about what, you know, what hasn't happened. But when you have been involved in creating the solution, it is, and it's the same actually, even just with role clarity, right? And those manager, you know, even something simple like manager one-on-ones, co-creating, okay, what are your priorities? What are the roadblocks? What do you want to do? Especially when you can't see them, it helps people keep engaged and understand um, how what they do and their actions matter. What are the challenges that lie ahead for employers? Maybe they've recognized it or not, but what what did you hear in this report? I mentioned one of the things that concerned me was the fatigue of backsliding that um, in some cases there may be, you know, we did a really good job in the beginning, but now it's, um, it's getting harder. Um, and so where some of that communication has fallen off. What are the challenges that lie ahead and what did you hear in the report? There are a number of challenges that lie ahead. I mean, one of the things that comes through is that, you know, we really, we all know about Zoom fatigue and um, there is really no good solution to in real life uh, connection, face-to-face connection. And we are all, even if we go to a a more of a hybrid model, we still need to solve for that. One of the biggest challenges, and I'm sure you've heard this a lot, is about onboarding um, new cohorts uh, and whole cohorts of new employees, especially more junior employees who may not have a strong professional background, who may not meet their manager in real life uh, for a long time. seems so weird to me. Yeah. Um, how do they learn? How do they get socialized? How do they contextualize? I spoke to someone recently who had started in her and she was, she was the manager or the leader and she started remotely. And so she's supposed to sort of be the boss, but it was kind of like no one invited her to out for drinks or do you know what I mean? Like, because she was supposed to be the boss. And I said, what was that like? And she said, the only word I can come up with is awkward. <laughs> I bet. I think that was so apt. Um, so onboarding, uh, and especially when we get into inclusion and belonging, right? How do you actually create that? Uh, customer retention. You know, one of the things that I saw very clearly, what, which was amazing and so exciting because I haven't seen it as clearly before, was that uh, leaders really understood the connection between their people and the bottom line. So they understood that if call center workers were struggling and were not okay, that that meant customer attrition, that it meant they couldn't give that customer experience, which meant loss of revenue. I've been seeing this for years and it was so exciting to see employee experience equals customer experience. You really can't do one without, you really can't do the uh, high quality, consistent customer experience without employee experience. I think the, the, one of the biggest things actually that I heard was Leaders who said, we just need some headspace. We just need to get out of the like grind and just be able to think strategically and just like have a whiteboard right now. I have a yeah. whiteboard in my office oh, now. Good. <laughs> just be with people and have a whiteboard and just like think about what we want to do. So when you asked about what's the plan for 2021, well, part of the challenge is that um, in many cases, there has not been the capacity to actually think strategically about what comes next. That's definitely a challenge. Um, And I think that's the fun part though, too, in in a lot of ways is to like figure out what's next and work through the challenges and think strategically. But yeah, I agree. Like people need to separate themselves and maybe schedule some thinking time in their day. And not a, a lot of people are good at that because 
when you're at home and you're working remotely, it's just like a constant grind. You feel like you always need to be doing stuff. I, I feel like this all the time, actually. But there's that time where as a leader, you really need to step away a little bit, maybe get on the whiteboard and just think strategically every once in a while. Because a lot of people are depending on managers and leaders to rise up. It's, you know, I think that's the other thing I agree. And sometimes it's like when you have a chance to catch your breath and you're working from home, I feel like that's usually the time I'm like, oh gosh, I need to walk the dog. <laughs> you know, I need to- <laughs> right. And I'm not thinking, let me get my whiteboard markers out right now. You know? Um, and I think all of those competing are like, did I leave dishes in the sink? Oh God, I did. And so there is that when you have five seconds to yourself, there are those things of like actually running a life you know, that come in. So not only is everyone really stretched thin at work and tired and creativity and innovation is starting to wane, but then there is balancing all the really, you know, real life pressures. Um, And I think that's one of the nice things that we go into hopefully over the holidays is getting a chance to really refresh and do some real planning and get excited for 2021. I actually think there's so much good stuff that we'll be able to do. And especially in the people space, so many opportunities to really accelerate things and make the most out of what has been a horrible situation. It's been shitty. Let's just put it that way. It's been really shitty. <laughs> it has been and heartbreaking and devastating. And I, in so many realms, right. And um, I think that's part of the obligation of this year. And especially for those of us in the people space is we have to take what's happened and make it mean something so that we can make things better in the future. Well, let's end it with this. Uh, Cause I know when you had conversations with, with all these people that you interviewed for the report, there had to have been something that came out of it, like quick wins that employers could have that you discovered. What are some of those like quick action items that employers could probably take? Maybe they're not aware of what they are, but you're going to help them right now. So what, what could they do to make life at work virtually uh, just a little bit better um there are some quick wins and they're really easy one we were talking about before the cross-functional create those cross-functional um collaboration opportunities certainly if you have hr people ops employee experience talent people in your communications team and a great it partner if you're looking in digital workplace um solutions there which is another whole area uh really having all those people in lockstep and collaborating is one easy quick win. The other low hanging fruit is just weaving your values and your purpose into everything you communicate. It can do a lot of the lifting for you. Um, it can connect people. The other thing I heard was people were, even companies that were much more, more mature and been around a long time, were adopting more of a startup mindset, not being afraid to tinker, to try new approaches and to evolve what they have been doing. And then I think the last quick win is just putting, in addition to managers, is putting some effort into finding those lost employees, the people that you haven't heard from who um, may not only be suffering, but may be representing risk to your business. Victoria Dew, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, Just such a pleasure to to have you back. And I've, I've missed you. It's been a few years. Where can people get the report and learn more about what you're up to? So yes, I would love for people to download the report from my website. We'll have, I'll give you the link for the show notes. Um, please also connect with me on LinkedIn and just let me know that you heard the podcast. So I know that you're um, coming from, I always love having these conversations and if they read the report and there's something that struck them or that they're like, Oh, that's like my company or like, that's not all at all. Like what goes on in my organization. Um, I just love these conversations as you can tell and want to want to continue them and I hope this work is valuable and provides some some ways for people to engage with in this work in this work and these conversations so thank you so much for having me Brandon and let's do it again soon yeah sounds good thanks Victoria 